in the Zoom classroom today. He appears as Public Programs Office host. He will be doing his best to assist anybody who's having technical problems. You can um, select Public Programs Office from the chat and send him a private message if you are having issues. But also please know that we're going to record the presentation and we will make it available to everyone after the event if you did have some trouble. Um, I'd like to ask everyone to please mute your microphones if you haven't already um, until the Q&A. That way we can hear the presenters and not have distractions. Um, this virtual event is funded by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. It is a literature artworks grant. Um, and that grant is to support connecting teens who are participating in ALA's Great Stories Club program with the authors that they're reading. So thank you to the NEA for supporting this event. For those who are not familiar with the Great Stories Club, it is ALA's literature-based reading, discussion, and library outreach program for teens. Complete information is available on our website. The most important goal um, <laughs> of the Great Stories Club is to inspire participating teens to consider big questions about the world around them and their place in it, affecting how they view themselves as thinkers, creators, and contributors. To those teens who are with us today in the virtual classroom, welcome. We are so happy that you're here. We hope that you're enjoying the books that you have been reading as part of the Great Stories Club program and having some good discussions about the ideas that are explored in the books about race, equity, empathy, social change, and being an active part of making positive changes to our world. We also hope that hearing Andrew and Nate's personal stories will help offer inspiring ways that both reading and nurturing creative self-expression, especially writing and drawing, can positively affect everyone's future. Great Stories Club grantees are with us today from two different cohorts, so I wanna call those out. One group is participating in the GSC pilot series on truth, racial healing, and transformation that is supported by a grant from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Everyone with those programs, uh, they're reading March book one as part of a themed collection called Growing Up Brave, Courage, and Coming of Age. We also have a brand new cohort of grantees joining us. They will be reading March book three as part of a themed series called Empathy, The Cost of Switching Sides, which is supported by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, to all of the librarians, library workers, community partners, and especially to the readers and uh, young teens who are with us today, thank you so much for being a part of the project and making the time for this event. Your librarians will all have the option to access chat, microphone, audio, and webcams during our Q&A, and we're very excited to hear from you soon, whether directly through your librarians and teachers um, or through the chat feature. We do ask that you hold questions until after the main presentation. For everyone else in the classroom today, I know we can't see you, but we know you're there. Um, those of you who are not involved in the Great Stories Club project, welcome. Your access in the classroom just allows you to view the presentation and you're also invited to stay for the Q&A if you would like to, but just know that due to logistics, you will not have access to a microphone or a web camera. Let's see if I can move my slide. Oh, it's not working, so I guess I'll just talk about it. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that if you would like to be part of a future round of the Great Stories Club and apply for a grant, you can visit our website now. Applications are currently being accepted and will be through November 16th for two new Great Stories Club series on truth, racial healing, and transformation. Um, this is just not going forward. Um, Yes, let's see here. Uh, those grants are going to provide training, reading materials, and financial support to host racial healing events, as well as book discussion programs during the period between March and December of 2019. So we hope that you will check that out. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Andrew Iden and Nate Powell. Andrew Iden is the Digital Director and Policy Advisor to Congressman Lewis in Washington, DC, a graduate of Trinity College in Hartford and Georgetown University in Washington, Andrew wrote his master's thesis on the theory on the history and impact of the 1957 comic book Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story. He is also, of course, creator and co-author of the graphic novel memoir series March. The world really owes a debt of gratitude for the existence of this incredible collection, which he will share more about soon. Andrew often speaks at schools and universities, participates in reading programs with incarcerated young adults. He serves as a national project advisor to the Great Stories Club for us. Um, and he has taught classes on script writing at the Smithsonian and appeared as a guest on the Rachel Maddow Show, Morning Joe, CBS This Morning, NPR, CNN, the BBC, and many other outlets. Andrew could not 
possibly be more generous with his time and talents, and we're very grateful for his continued engagement and for being here today. We also have Nate Powell with us. Nate is a New York Times bestselling graphic novelist born in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1978, currently living in Bloomington, Indiana with his family. Nate began self-publishing at the age of 14 and graduated from School of Visual Arts in 2000. His work includes the brand new Ozark existential horror tale, Come Again, which just came out over the summer. In addition to the March series, his other works include You Don't Say, Any Empire, Swallow Me Whole, The Silence of Our Friends, The Year of the Beasts, and Rick Riordan's The Lost Hero. He is the first cartoonist ever to win the National Book Award. Um, now I'm going to hand the floor over to Nate and Andrew. Thank you so much for being here. I will try to stop sharing and uh, turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lainey. Thank you so much for having us. It's always a pleasure to be able to work with you. I mean, it, the work you're doing on this program is incredible. and uh, uh, Anything I can do to continue to support it, uh, especially with the teachers, um, you all let me know. Um, Nate, I, 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 do you want to start off too? And do we want to do our, our one, two? Uh, yeah, wait, hold on. Let me, let me mute. Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, yeah, yes. You, you just muted yourself. Oh, I know. I, yeah, I, I muted myself while explaining I was muting myself. Sorry. Uh, yeah, we can, we can uh, kind of approach it with our usual jam style. You want you want me to go first? Well, no, I just wanted to see if you want to say anything before we get oh, started. Glad, glad to be here, y'all. I'm glad to be a part of this fantastic program. I'm glad to see that it's continuing. And, uh, you know, March, its impact and our work couldn't have had the resonance it's had without the work of teachers, librarians, bookstore people, gatekeepers to ideas, to concepts. So thank you for continuing to push what needs to be pushed. Awesome. Um, well, so I guess I think we should start with just sort of how all this came about, because it is always a, a question that I get is, you know, uh, why do a graphic novel? Why, why do this? Um, and for me, it all started, uh, it was the summer of 2008. I was working as the Congressman's press secretary on his reelection campaign. Um, and, and for me, you know, this was like a transformative experience. I had grown up, uh, my father uh, was a Muslim Turkish immigrant uh, who I never really knew, um, who left when I was very young. Uh, and I was raised by my mother. Um, she was a single mom. She was a sweet Southern lady. Um, and, you know, you, you grow up without a father and your mother's trying to show you male role models. It, a lot of it came through reading. I mean, we were a reading family. And for me, I started getting into comics. Comics were my outlet. It was, uh, I started reading my old, my uncle's old comic books that he had left at my grandmother's house. And my grandmother pulled them out one day when she didn't know what else to do with me. And I was just fascinated. I was entranced. And so um, then she took me to the Piggly Wiggly, uh, which is a real grocery store in Western North Carolina. Uh, and there was a spinner rack of comics and I, I begged her if she would buy me one. She said, sure, of course. And I got an Uncanny X-Men uh, number 317. It was the Phalanx Covenant. It has a lenticular cover for the comic nerds out there. Um, and, it, and in a way it changed my life because it opened me up to this whole world of uh, creators making stories uh, with characters who were trying to do right because it was simply the right thing to do. And I think as I grew up and as I got frustrated simply seeing the way my mother was treated as a single mother, the way I was treated, um, being the, the, the child of a single parent, the child of a Muslim immigrant, um, you know, I, I gravitated towards it. It was my outlet, it was my, my haven. So I come and I go through college, I go and I start and I get, it's where my social um, consciousness came from. Uh, this sense that I have an obligation to do more uh, to help others than, than to help myself. And so I went into public service. I started working for the Lieutenant Governor of Connecticut after college. Uh, I was his uh, special assistant, which really meant that I knew where to get all of his favorite pies uh, in, in Connecticut. Um, I can still tell you wherever you wanna go where the closest piece of pie is available. Um, but I started, I was basically a gopher, you know, and I sort of worked my way up from there. And then I started working for another member of Congress in Connecticut. And then I had the opportunity to join John Lewis's staff uh, answering his mail, um, which I can assure you is a very glamorous job involving uh, endless paper cuts and uh, a staggering amount of, of mail. 
Um, and, and that's where it all started. And so eventually I was offered the, the job to move up and the congressman's staff to work as his press secretary on his reelection campaign. And it was great because it was an opportunity for me to go back home. Um, I hadn't been back to Atlanta since I'd left to go to college and it was my first time back. And it, it allowed me to look at the city and the stories that I heard as a young person in a different way. Because here you have, here I'm working for John Lewis. This is, this is people questioning his very um, existence, why he should be a member of Congress. And, you know, he starts telling these stories of the movement, stories that I thought I had heard um, over and over and over again when I was growing up in Atlanta. I'd been to the King Center a dozen times. You know, it's, it's, it's part of the DNA uh, of the city of Atlanta, the civil rights movement. And yet here I was on this campaign hearing Congressman Lewis tell stories that I had never heard before. The stories of the young people of SNCC, the stories of um, what these young men and women were capable of doing to push the leaders that I had heard of to take some of their boldest actions. And, and then I saw the young people and, and the kids who were frankly not much older than I was at that point, and their eyes lighting up, realizing that they had that power, they had that capacity. I was inspired by it. And then towards the end of the campaign, you know, folks started uh, talking about what they were going to do afterwards. Some folks said they were going to go to the beach. Some folks said they were going to go to the parents. And I said that I was going to a comic book convention. I was going to Dragon Con, which I'd been to basically every year since I was 12 years old. And, the kind of, and, and everybody laughed at me. You can understand. It was politics. And, and comics were not uh, something they understood. And... And then I heard a deep voice from the back say, don't laugh. There was a comic book during the movement, and it was very influential. And it was John Lewis standing up for me as he stood up for so many of us. And it was a comic book called Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story. And I became captivated by it. I went home that night. I looked it up on the internet. And I read it. It was beautiful. 16 pages, cover to cover. Uh, classic studio house style from the 1950s. Um, and a wonderful introduction to both the Montgomery bus boycott, the principles of nonviolence, the history of Gandhi, um, the principles of civil disobedience. And so I remember sitting there that night looking at it, having heard all these stories of John Lewis over that summer and thinking, well, why isn't there a John Lewis comic book? And at the time, it seemed so self-evident to me, um, but no one else. And so... The next day I went back to the office and we were working and, and finally we raised this question of um, how, do you, how do you reach young people? How do you tell them the story of the movement? How do you explain to them what it was that John Lewis did as a young person? And you know, I raised my hand in that meeting and I, and I said, you know, I think you should write a comic book. And there was this long pause as everybody's head sort of turned to look at me and nobody said a word. And then they just moved on. Nobody even like dismissed it. It was just like, ugh, ugh. And I, I was sort of flabbergasted by it, you know, because it was like, oh, this seems like a great idea. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't you automatically get this? I don't understand. Um, and so I kept bringing it up, you know, over the next couple of days, next couple of weeks, over and over and over again, as we had more of these conversations, how do we reach young people? I would say, you know, you should write a comic book. This is, this is for real. You should do it. And I got a lot of no's and some, and eventually the congressman said, you know, oh, well, maybe, you know, which was in politics is a nice way of saying no. And um, finally, I, it was just like the last week of the campaign. We we're out on the road and I don't know what did it, but I mentioned it one more time and the congressman finally said, okay, I'll do it, but only if you write it with me. And that moment changed my life. Um, now, I think you can all imagine that uh, getting from there to here is, is sort of a wild and crazy process. Um, you know, it, it was, John Lewis had written a book before about his life in the movement. It did okay. Some people read it. It won a few awards. Um, but I never read it. I never read it in school. I didn't understand it. Um, I don't know if they could see you, Nate. <laughs> um, and so... Um, so I started with nothing. I mean, it was John Lewis simply saying yes. And I wrote out an outline uh, by hand. I still have the piece of paper. I, I pull it out from time to time to remind myself where all this started from. It was seven chapters that I originally outlined. And uh, I started looking for a publisher. 
And I swear to God, I got more no's than Mitch McConnell. It was, uh, it was as if, you know, all of publishing thought this was a terrible idea and that it should never happen. And I just kept hammering away until one year. And it, this, is, this is almost a year and a half after the congressman had said yes. And I've been telling him, yeah, this will work. Trust me, trust me. And everybody's been saying no. Finally, the congressman comes with me to Dragon Con. Here he comes full circle. He wanted to see what this crazy place I went to was. Um, and he's having lunch with me. And a comic creator that I bought comics from when I was a kid comes up to the table. And he's like, oh, my God, you're John Lewis. You're a real celebrity. And I'm kind of, you know, taken aback because here's my childhood meeting my adulthood in real form. And, uh, they, t you know, I take the picture like a good staffer. And um, <laughs> they, uh, he says, if you ever need anything, let me know. And uh, so I called him up. And the only phone number I had for him was the front desk of Marvel Comics. And, you know, I, I don't know how much you know, but Congress and comics do not have the best relationship, and especially not at that time. So when I called up the front desk at Marvel Comics and they said, oh, wh where are you calling from? I said, well, you know, I'm with Congressman John Lewis. Again, with this very long pause where you could tell they were, they were very, very concerned about why someone from the congressman's office would be calling. And finally, they, they put me through and I got to talk to Jimmy and he referred me to Top Shelf. And, and that's sort of how, and that's how we found our publisher uh, at a comic book convention like that. And then from there, we actually had to write it. And I've never written a book before. Um, this was the first time I'd ever tried it. So in some ways, I think that helped because I didn't know what to do, but it also meant that I didn't know what everybody else had done. And I knew that, and I could do it differently. I could do it in my own way. Um, I brought everything I could as a congressional state. It had to be John Lewis's voice. It had to be sourced. There had to be a quote. And I didn't realize nobody had made comics like this before. The, the, the nonfiction comics, mostly had sort of been glossed over. They make up the dialogue. They sort of ad lib here and there. They, it's a general thing. But, but what we saw, set out to do was to make a, a book that would stand alongside any other nonfiction book, graphic novel or otherwise, whether it's Taylor Branch or or Diane McWhorter, or so many of these people who've written about the movement, we wanted to be as accurate as they were. And then, and then use that source material and all the research to be able to make it plain, as the congressman says, to allow someone with the artistic talent like Nate to take these pictures and show the movement from a different perspective. Because when you look at a film or you look at a documentary, you're, you're outside of it, it's third person. But what you can do with a comic book is so much more, it's so much more personal. You can look at it through the eyes of the participants, through the eyes of the victims, through the eyes of the perpetrators, and, and change the perspective of the reader in understanding how these stories uh, really happen. And that's what we did. I mean, we spent almost five years working on just the just getting the first book done before the first book came out and you know when you, you're taking down someone like john lewis's story you know these are a lot of late nights and weekends and things because he's got a day job right i mean he's still a congressman and so you know we'd be on the phone he'd be falling asleep i'd be falling asleep you know you just hear that snore on the other end of the line just like and then you have to lie about it later and be like, I'm sorry, Congressman, I swear you didn't fall asleep. I didn't hear anything. Um, but that's, that's the sort of work it took to get this off the ground. And then um, by the time we had that first book done, you know, we, didn't, we didn't know if it was gonna work. I mean, everything up to that point had been a struggle. It had been a struggle to, to get people to even take it seriously once we had the book out because everybody was sort of asking, well, why is John Lewis writing comic books? This is weird. And it wasn't until I got a phone call from a reporter at the Wall Street Journal that I knew that this would work. And he called me and said, you know, I got this advanced copy of your book and I wanted you to know I really enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed it so much, in fact, that I gave it to my nine-year-old son. And I wanted you to know that he read it and then he went and put on his Sunday suit and now he's marching around my house demanding equality for everyone. And that was it. That was the moment. The idea that we could instill a social consciousness in every nine-year-old or everybody who's over nine in this country sort of reframed what it was we were trying to do. It was no longer about telling John Lewis's story. 
we, we wrote this essay where we, we laid it out in an issue of Creative Loafing, where we, we very clearly said we were trying to inspire this generation to enact their own nonviolent revolution, to understand their power and to understand their capacity, to pressure elected officials, to pressure the government, to enact substantive political and policy-based change, just as they had during the civil rights movement. Congressman had something he used to say, he says a lot, where he says sometimes he felt like we were too quiet and we were trying to fix that. We set out to show people what happened, how it happened, so that they could do it again. And I think that's something we all need right now. We're struggling with powerlessness. We're struggling with, you know, I went through it when I was nine. I mean, it's this idea of needing a role model who isn't rich, who isn't famous already, who comes from nothing and works his way up through the power of his beliefs. And that's what John Lewis was as a young man. And I think that's, that's what we all need, especially as young people ourselves. And so March, for all the other things that it's been called and that it has become, it was really for those kids like myself who needed a little hope, who needed a little inspiration, who needed a better path. Um, and, I, and I still, to this day, struggle to live up to um, the heights that the book and the story have reached because you know, we, we now, as creators, have an obligation to continue this work, but we have to be moral and ethical about it, and we have to do it in such a way that we show you that we're human beings, but that human beings are capable of doing so much more than we often give them credit for. And so that's, that's what, you know, that's my story. That's how I became involved with it. I'm sure there's a bunch more anecdotes I could get into, and we'll get into it with the questions. Um, but, you know, it's just been, it's been a, a a great joy in my life to be able to work on this project, to be able to have something that I believe in to spend my time on. I think sometimes that's, that's been my greatest frustration when I don't have something that I'm truly passionate about. So to have something that I am truly passionate about uh, was a gift. And so I appreciate all the nice things people say about it, but in many ways, I think it's given me far more than I've ever been able to give anyone else. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Nate and um, thank you so much for listening. Man, that was that was wonderful, Andrew. Thanks, man. Uh, hey, everybody, it's how's kind of it weird going? To stare at yourself like, oh, oh, yes, it is. I, that's what that's what I've been doing this whole time. Like, how's it going, everybody? And to the invisible masses who are somewhere out there in computer land. Uh, so I'm Nate, I'm the artist on March, and uh, I guess I'll I'll lay out a little bit of where I come from, and uh, what my path was that led me into the position of drawing March from Andrew's script. Uh, so I was born in 1978. I just turned 40. Um, from Arkansas. Uh, I also lived in Montgomery, Alabama in elementary school. And my parents are baby boomers from northern Mississippi. Uh, all this is significant because, uh, you know, as a kid, you know, like a middle class white kid growing up in the mid 80s in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, my parents did give me a basic working knowledge of the civil rights movement. Uh, it was, you know, a basic mix of historical information and personal anecdotes to help fill out the picture of, of their youth and the context through which they grew up. But with a lot of the history that I did learn from my parents, and, and this is very common, I feel like, amongst a lot of... Uh, kids of my generation from the American South. Uh, I think my, my parents almost punctuated every, every story and every anecdote with an exception. It was just kind of like, oh, but that was a different time. That back then has nothing to do with now. Uh, basically pulling a, pulling a Jedi mind trick, more or less like, these are not the droids you're looking for. Uh, and I didn't have the vocabulary for it at the time, but it didn't sit right with me because, you know, like I was living in Montgomery, Alabama, and some of the, you know, the footage, the photography, but also the stories that I was, that allowed me to learn about the civil rights movement literally happened three miles down the street from my house, uh, places I had already visited in person. And, uh, it didn't make sense to me that there seemed to be some kind of effort happening in 
you know, in the recesses of my parents' mind and of their generation to kind of take away this idea that this was a part of a historical continuum. As I grew older, I realized that a lot of effort, you know, went into making their particular generation of well-meaning white baby boomers feel a little less anxious or a little less guilty about growing up in and through the end of uh, what we would recognize as Jim Crow segregation in the South. Uh, and so the older I got, the more I started to pay attention to the fact that, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of attention was paid to being like, there was a problem. Uh, then the civil rights movement solved some problems and uh, those problems went away. And that's obviously an, an over simple way to, to lay it out. But uh, it really wasn't until I think I met Andrew that he introduced me to the Southern Poverty Law Center's concept of the nine word problem, which is perfectly encapsulates this weird tension I had when learning about uh, civil rights history as a kid, uh, which is that most kids graduate from high school in America knowing nine words about the movement. And that's Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream. Uh, and it's really hard to connect those dots when you only have, you have three moments. Uh, and actually recently my parents brought up some leftover stuff from their house and I was digging through it and I found some art that I did in first grade. Uh, it was like March book zero, but I did this uh, pictorial illustration and a one page report on Dr. King. And uh, it was amazing in that uh, all the language of it really did uh, lay out the history of the civil rights movement in that very simplistic way that, that didn't allow for any room for questioning how it seemed so simple or how any gains were made. Um, and uh, it's been a really nice thing to hold on to uh, in the, the months since I, I discovered it. I think I made it in 1984. Um, so basically, uh, also, like a lot of the footage, the photography and the, the video that was captured throughout the movement from the late 50s into the late 60s, uh, virtually all of it is fairly grainy black and white footage. And for any of us who were born after like 1970, this is how we relate to history. When we are looking at documentation of history, we see it in black, white and shades of gray. And so I think generationally, like for Generation X and for millennials and for the new crew coming up, I think uh, there is this kind of layer of abstraction that happens when, you know, all of a sudden you're making a transition from black and white into color. And uh, it made me realize that effort has to be put forth to kind of try to destroy that layer of abstraction. Uh, and that informed and influenced my visual approach to doing March. That's part of the reason why I chose to do it in these gray washes. That's how I relate to documentation of civil rights history. And that's how virtually everyone of my generation and younger does. Um, so, all right, I've been publishing comics for 26 years and I don't think of March as necessarily being that different from the self-published superhero comics I did in high school. Uh, and it's really awesome for March to be part of this larger social conversation where comics have always had to fight and stand their ground for their legitimacy as art, as literature, in this case, as memoir, as history, and as entertainment. Uh, all of these things can exist at one time, but as comics uh, are able to stake out more ground and be taken more seriously, I feel like there's a big simultaneous movement to try to be like, well, these comics are legitimate and mature. These are not the comics you grew up with. There, there's always this push to have kind of a distance between superhero comics uh, and independent comics, graphic novels, uh, stuff that, that surpasses basic power struggles. Um, and to push back on that, I think it, it's more important every day just like Andrew, uh, I really got my social conscience from the X-Men. Um, and uh, I think it allowed me to perceive my world uh, and perceive, perceive things like racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, nationalism, filtered through 
the lens of X-Men comics and their struggles for survival and for equality and for justice. Uh, it allowed me to see my world in a new way. It allowed me to, to feel empowered and feel like I had something to say. And when the time came to actually start making my own comics, um, it was a natural enough uh, transition. So if it weren't for X-Men, I really would not be doing March. And, and I see them as part of a continuum uh, of reading, but a continuum of context by which we are all able to think about and process uh, justice and injustice uh, in our world. So I think going into uh, working on the March trilogy with Andrew and with Congressman Lewis, uh, once they got a publisher, uh, this was sometime in 2010, maybe late 2010, and I was wrapping up work on two other books. Uh, one was called Any Empire, and the other was The Silence of Our Friends, which was also largely autobiographical from the writer's viewpoint of being a kid in Houston, Texas in the mid late sixties against the backdrop of a forgotten chapter of civil rights movement history. Uh, so I was wrapping up work on these books. I read the press release on Top Shelf's website about this project, March, and I was like, oh, awesome idea, cool. Uh, there was no artist listed, so I, I was busy. I didn't put two and two together that maybe that meant there was no artist. So I was like, well, cool, back to work. And a couple of weeks later, our publisher, Chris Starris gave me a call, uh, basically suggesting that I try out for the role um, and got me in touch with Andrew. Uh, and we just kind of went back and forth and I did some demo pages based on Andrew's script, got some notes from him and the Congressman. I redrew those pages, got some more notes. I, I redrew parts of those, but pretty quickly, like within two weeks, we realized we just clicked well um, and decided to move forward. And thanks to my work on the silence of our friends, that was kind of like boot camp for March uh, from an artistic viewpoint. And it allowed me to work out some of the basics of things I had never really had to consider before. Like how, how do you figure out what the, what the technology, the fashion, the cars, mm -hmm. uh, what the outsides of buildings, uh, what seats might look like inside the buildings. Uh, how do you determine what these details were when you're doing something that is historical? Um, and I spent a lot of time figuring out that process for myself in a very rudimentary way on the silence of our friends, but that allowed me to kind of just jump in and, uh, and, and work on March while I had to up my game as the March trilogy continued. Uh, I feel like in that aspect, uh, March book one is very different uh, for Andrew and I than March books two and three. And one reason um, is because March book one is largely the story of young John Lewis uh, coming of age into the world, becoming involved in activism and social struggle, but through his eyes, in his words, strictly. Uh, and a lot of it is very much a first person experience. It has to do with the sights and the sounds that, that John Lewis as a young person was taking in. Uh, and a lot of it takes place, you know, on his family home, his farm. Um, and there really isn't a lot of reference uh, for details, uh, visual reference that, that I could go by. Um, but it also kind of illuminated that as the civil rights movement expanded after uh, the sit-in movement in the late 50s and the early 1960s, uh, there started to be more and more press coverage. Uh, and so the presence of more and more reporters, cameramen, photographers resulted in this, you know, ultimately this massive archive of documentation about the civil rights movement. However, in what is contained in March book one, uh, it was really interesting to see relatively how little there was. Uh, so Andrew and the Congressman had a fantastically researched archive of, of stuff for me to go with. And I started to figure out how to get what else I needed, whether it was looking sort of in between lines of the script to see what wasn't explicitly detailed, whether that was a detail I needed to find for my own purposes, or whether those were moments which allowed me to kind of like spread my wings and fly as an artist. And a lot of that was the more personal um, 
sort of internal thought processes and feelings that John Lewis and his peers might be having. Uh, the the go-to example, I think, that sort of sets that difference with March Book One is when John Lewis, as a boy, uh, is trying so hard to get to school every day, but for planning time and harvest time, his parents expect him to be home with all his brothers and sisters because he's needed on the farm. So basically he develops this, this daily, like Wile E. Coyote roadrunner routine where he's pretending like he's going into the fields to work and then he just cuts a beeline, hides under the porch or wherever from his parents and waits uh, until the bus arrives and tries to outrun his parents and make it to the school bus. Uh, recognizing that, you know, that one can describe this scene in prose, in text, uh, pretty briefly, but in comics form with the way that we're absorbing information, it's about that weight. It's about that five minutes or that 10 minutes spent under the porch, hoping your family doesn't find you trying to outrun them to get on the school bus to get an education. And so learning to stretch that line of script where needed into a page or two pages. Um, I think that's something that over the course of March book one, uh, that was the story of Andrew and I learning to work together. Uh, me learning how to draw to his, to and for his strengths as a writer. And he is a writer learning to write for my particular voice as, as an artist. Uh, and I feel like by the end of the first book, we kind of ironed that out. And so book two, uh, we were able to sort of jump into the storytelling with a lot more confidence, but we also had a lot more responsibilities once we got into that second book. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the expanding nature of the civil rights movement uh, and having a lot more to be accountable for, a lot more research to back up. Uh, another thing uh, in terms of, as Andrew was saying earlier, not knowing exactly, you know, no, knowing the story we needed to tell and knowing how to tell it right, uh, hoping we could do a good enough job, but not knowing what the ultimate destination or the potential scope or scale could be. As soon as March Book One came out, I for one was, really surprised just to hear from, te from teachers and from educators like, oh, uh, I teach this in my American history class. Uh, but just to hear from somebody explicitly that they're teaching it in school in history, not in English class was a wake up call for me. Where I was like, A, that's amazing. But B, how do we keep it in history class? Like Andrew was way ahead of the game compared to me on this, but I was like, I don't know the guidelines that dictate what keeps, you know, history books on the curriculum in history class that allows them to pass a series of standards. So I feel like that was one of these sort of second full-time jobs that got added on top of the roles of actually just writing and drawing the books. Uh, so once we, we figured out how those levels of responsibility and accountability to history worked, um, we were kind of like re-educating ourselves in the process of how to turn this history and how to turn this personal account into a book. Now that we were starting to see this, you know, new larger home in, in a lot of settings, including schools. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, I feel like I find myself inevitably kind of returning, especially now to the urgency of providing uh, kind of a truthful historical accounts of American struggles for equality, for representation, for justice. And everybody does need a good civil rights education. Going back to the, the nine word problem, I didn't get any civil rights education in school. Like, and that includes growing up in the South, like both of my American history classes uh, never even got to those units, uh, however brief they may have even been before the school year was over. And that's like growing up in Montgomery, Alabama, and then growing up in Little Rock, home of the Little Rock Nine. Not a word was mentioned in school about these chapters in the civil rights movement for me. Um, okay, so, you know, March is part of an effort, you know, to continue to show the civil rights movement, particularly in 2018, hopefully in a context with struggles 
you know, concurrent struggles for women's rights, for workers' rights, for LGBTQ rights. Uh, and it's important simply to be able to show this history on its face. People are smart. People are able to make their own connections and they're able to ask important questions, you know, of their own accord. So on its face, just the concept of providing truthful historical accounts of struggles for equality, it seems like such a no-brainer that I think a lot of folks uh, will sort of discount that it's necessary to really like make a strong case for keeping, keeping stories and keeping history like this in the public consciousness, in classrooms, in institutional settings. Uh, what I'm saying is there's an assumption that just providing that history isn't itself a problem. But here's the thing, Southern Poverty Law Center has given 20 states an F on their civil rights education. And several of those states require zero civil rights education whatsoever. In that regard, like it's not a matter of just making the history available to people. And it's not just about letting people of all kinds see heroes who look like them. Though that is very important. What it's about is seeing connections between seemingly different struggles and seeing equality as being something that's in everyone's interest. And that's a very dangerous idea to those in power. So when we are able to provide that rich history, uh, one thing that we do is we disrupt the dominant narrative of leaders and figureheads passing change down from the mountaintop. Uh, something that I kind of took for granted that I was oblivious to until I started work on March was how much of a generational conflict within uh, the civil rights movement and within the black community itself uh, the 1950s and 60s were for the movement. The fact that John Lewis and his younger peers were involved in intergenerational dialogue and pushback with Dr. King and his peers, who are really only about 10 years older. And then that generation is involved in, you know, intergenerational debate and conflict with the generation previous to them, to the Thurgood Marshalls and the A. Philip Randolphs. Uh, I think that the further along we got with Marx, the more focused we got on highlighting that kind of disagreement, growing schisms, uh, people having sometimes very considerable philosophical and strategic uh, differences uh, and splits in ideas about how to go about uh, this massive social change. And we wanted to highlight that disagreement, uh, highlight that this was, you know, its strength lay in the fact that there were many schools of thought. And even though some of these disagreements could become really heated and can leave some deep wounds, uh, these were folks who still showed up in the streets together because they had a common objective that had to be moved towards. Um, and uh, I don't know, I, I guess I, you look like you're about to say something, Andrew. Mm. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> So I, I guess to wrap up my end, my end of just the, of, of laying out this process, uh, when I signed up as artist on March, uh, and I immediately started by digging through Walking with the Wind, uh, Congressman Lewis's memoir from the late 90s, I immediately identified with John Lewis as a six-year-old within the first 20 pages of the book. And... Uh, I did grow up at that time when I was six. I grew up about 40 miles from where his house was as a six-year-old, though we grew up different generations and in a very different context. I was drawn immediately to the, like, the intensity and the gravity through which he saw the world, particularly the way that he picked up on fairness and injustice, even when his world was extremely small, uh, on the farm, then moving out to the inequality uh, with the schools and his community. Uh, I remember see, experiencing the world with that same level of intensity and gravity when I was six. I think most people do. I have a six-year-old now and uh, she's mighty intense. And I, I think, you know, like by the time you're four, you have a really finely tuned sense of fairness and injustice. You know what bullies are. Uh, you've seen people 
uh, experience injustice at the hands of difference, just difference itself. Uh, so when my daughter was four, we started reading March book one together by her request. And it was really interesting to kind of read it with her at her level. So as he grew, as she grew and as her worldview expanded, being able to get a little more specific, a little more concrete and moving from like, you know, injustice based on difference to at her level, uh, recognizing how arbitrary difference based on skin hue might be, then getting into the way that law functions uh, and, and what happens in terms of activism to change unjust law. Uh, it's, it's been a really fascinating experience and I feel like my education has continued after finishing March by sort of passing that experience, that history on to my kid as she grows to sort of equip her for the world that you are all inheriting. Um, it's been very encouraging. So what, what I try to emphasize is like, look, here's what a dedicated, thoughtful, committed group of young people did to shape the fabric of our society, not despite being 20 years old, but specifically because they were 20. And so for folks who are young, the challenge being, what will you do when you are 20? And the good news is, you get to decide that, but this is not a drill and it never has been. So we're, we're just really glad to play a part in being able to present that challenge and present sort of a roadmap of successes and failures of previous movements that we can all build on for a more just society. That's all I got. Lainey, can we take some questions? Absolutely. Um, so to get started, um, we've got two groups that are working with teens directly that we wanted to start with their questions. Amelia, I wanted to find out um, if you would like me to pose the, the three questions from your group or if you would like to get on camera and or microphone. I'll just give that a second. And we, we would like to see everybody we can. I know. I don't know that Amelia's readers can get on. Amelia? Hi. I am actually with a different group than the ones that emailed the questions. OK. So, so you want me to just go through them? If you want to go through them, or they're, on, they're online also right now. Oh, wonderful. Robert, if you want to read some of the questions, Joe and Robert, or Lainey can. Um, Joe or Robert, it would be great if you would. Sure, we can do that. Um, you wanna give me Let me just give a quick introduction. These are, these are young men who are participating in the Great Stories Club at the Johnson Youth Center in Juneau, Alaska. And I think we've got three different um, uh, classrooms running over there. So Robert, I'll mute myself. We do, and, and I apologize that you can't see them. You can probably only see me and it looks dark in here. And that's simply because at the Youth Center here, we have a, um, a, a video recording rule that, that we can't get around. So anyway, our first question, is um, uh, from, from our students is, you likely feel unarmed black teens being killed by police is unjust. What do you think needs to happen to solve this problem? Um, so I think this is a, a failure of leadership on the part of our elected officials who have sought to find a simple solution to a complicated problem, right? It's not, it's not, just the policing that's the issue it's that it's that on the one hand we have cut our mental health services we have cut our family services we have cut our education services we have cut transportation services we have cut 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 away from services that help individuals lead healthy lives in our society and then we have put the ramifications of that on the police and ask them to deal with it so that they're a mental health professional they're a healthcare professional they're a family services professional, a child welfare professional, all at the same time as they're supposed to be protecting and enforcing. And on top of that, you've made it so that it is a profession that is incredibly difficult for people to do well. So that you, you, you often have high turnover rates in many of the major police forces around the country that prevents people from uh, becoming a part of the community in order to enforce and police effectively, to know who's actually a threat and who's not. 
Um, and, and on top of all of that, we've allowed the use of deadly force to become a common occurrence, which is just absolutely outrageous. And, and, on, and, I, okay, and I can keep going because I feel like the police unions have played a role in this too, where they want to protect their members and that's understandable. But at the same time, there has to be accountability. And so you've got all of these problems within the police force, within our social services, within our country, um, that are then exacerbated by this continued dialogue that, that puts down people of color, right? Black, brown, um, we, we, we continue to, to act as if um, being a certain color uh, or a certain ethnicity or a certain religion entitles you to a certain amount of rights. And, and that's just fundamentally wrong. And that's not what this country was founded on. That, that's not the fundamental beliefs that, that I have and that I know many of people in the uh, working with us have. I, I think um, if we're going to do anything about it, we've got to look at it holistically. We cannot simply say that body cameras are going to fix it because they're not. We've got to make sure that the police are trained. We've got to make sure that there's background checks. We've got to make sure that it's a profession that people can do and live normal and healthy lives, that the officers aren't put in danger. But then we cannot act like a kid not having a place to go after school and then being in the wrong place at the wrong time is the kid's fault. And we can't act that like, like there's not profiling going on because it's simply an easier option for many departments. We can't act like like uh, uh, the seizures of personal property aren't rampant in this country and that the police officers are using that in certain places as, as ways of supplementing their budget. I mean, there's all of these problems that are going on and until we address a, a wide range of these challenges, any one solution is not gonna give us um, any sort of meaningful, long lasting change. And I think that's the problem. Too many people are too afraid to say, we're not spending enough money helping people. And that's it, right? How, many, how often do you see police officers being used to enforce uh, laws against homeless people? Why are we spending money on that when we could be spending money on giving them a roof over their head, giving them mental health services, giving them healthcare services, giving them education services, helping them get back up on their feet? And it's all just a waste of human life. And it's sad, but you know what the underlying, the underlying demon is in this conversation? And that's profit. It's profit in the prisons. It's profit in all the people who sell all these fancy guns to the police officers. It's profit on the people who make money on poor education in these for-profit schools and these, these different education uh, uh, groups that are, that are just sucking student loan money. Um, it's profit. And we've got to start saying that people are more important than profit. That has to be our fundamental belief as a nation, that, that human beings are more important than money. And I don't know what it's going to take for us to get there. We are trying to preach that gospel and that discipline ourselves through March. But it's going to take all of us working together, looking at a broad range of issues and not acting like it's simply an urban problem, a Chicago problem, a gun problem, a police problem because it's a lot of problems all coming together, creating this systemic problem that is costing people lives and putting people in jail who don't necessarily need to be there and putting them in the criminal justice system too early and for too long. But I just write comics, so, you know, they don't always listen to me. Nate, is there, is there anything you wanted to add? You said that more perfectly than I could hope to say it, so I, I rest my case along with you. Okay. Yeah, but thank you for that question. I mean, I think it's incredibly important right now. And I, and I, and I try and raise it as much as I can in many different places. I think Nate can vouch in, in many ways. Um, I, I'm the guy who brings up the issue when you're not supposed to. Uh, I think we went and spoke to the, uh, they, they had to speak at the New York Federal Reserve Bank, which for a comic book people is pretty insane. And the congressman's having this very nice, sweet meeting with the guy, and they're shaking hands. They all want to take picture, and I'm and I just I, I just cornered him. I'm like, let's talk about student loans, sir. And you know that's 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 who I try and be because you can't let people become comfortable. Um, it, it, it's the same thing about being maladjusted that the congressman talks about his own youth. 
uh, talks about with his own youth, where we all have to be maladjusted to any injustice. And we have to be willing to speak up and speak out about it. Because until this issue is so uh, permanently etched in the front of people's consciousness in their, in their minds that then they're going to continue to ignore it because it is so hard and it is so difficult. Um, but that's also, if I was one bad day away from being on the other side of that glass because you don't grow up with a single mom um, and, and not have some close calls. It's just too easy to, to, to fall and, and, and have a bad day and have your whole life direction changed um, for what is fundamentally bad luck, not bad character. Do you have another question? Do we have one more from Juno and then we can maybe move over to Towson, Maryland? Also, please invite us to Alaska. I'd love to go there. <laughs> well, consider yourself invited. Uh, everyone says we'll, we'll happily take you fishing. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, I, I think I can, I can offer one more from another student here. Um, uh, here's this one I think they'll enjoy the answer to. How does an author get paid for their work? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, do you, you want to do this one, Nate? Cause, sure. Cause you, you, yeah. Sure. Uh, this is where, yeah, the, the book world and the comics world are definitely not the same, but they're generally speaking, here's how it functions. Uh, yeah. You, you have your, your concept for the book or for your creation. Uh, you wind up, yeah, you pitch it around. You have like an outline, a synopsis. You have samples showing what you can do. Uh, and the same is for me. Like I've got a ton of different books, but each new idea I have, I have to start over from square one and, you know, pitch my basic concept and, and sort of show what I'm aiming for by the time I finish uh, usually when a book publisher uh, decides to take on your project, when you sign a contract to work with that publisher, uh, they'll pay you a smaller amount of money as an advance payment against money you might make later when the book comes out. Uh, sometimes that's as small as like a couple hundred bucks. Sometimes if you luck out, you know, it might be, you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and so that's called an advance payment. And the way it functions in real time is uh, if you sign a contract for a book, you take that advance payment and it allows you to be able to get groceries and pay your rent for as much time as possible out of the time that you're gonna need to spend making the rest of your book. Uh, almost always that means you need to be working on other projects or you're still working your day job uh, a lot of my cartoonist friends, uh, I don't know, this is where the game has changed. Like there's no, not only is there no longer a shame factor about doing your work when you can and keeping your day job, but I think a lot of that experience of having full-time work or part-time work somewhere else helps enrich your own understanding of the world and really helps you be a better creator. Um, well, anyway, once the book is finished uh, and it's published, uh, you earn, you know, a, if it's like a $20 book, you might earn between, yeah, you know, five and 12% of that, that 20 bucks goes back to you. Uh, so let's just say it's like $2 a pop for the book. Uh, and, uh, but you have to pay back, uh, that amount of money that you were given when you signed the contract. So what you do is you keep on hustling and talking about your book, doing signings, traveling around, and you keep on making work. You keep on you know, working on the next thing. Uh, eventually you will start to, to make a little bit of money off of, off of each book. And over time that accumulates to sort of help. Like I, I started working with publishers back in 2002 and it wasn't until 2009 I was able to quit my job and be a full-time cartoonist. But really it wasn't until about 2014 after March book one came out, after I had started doing this Rick Riordan book, uh, that all of those books that were in print and all the new work I was doing kind of had a cumulative effect with little paychecks here and there that allowed me to actually make a living 
uh, as, a, as a creator so that I was sweating a little bit less. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that it, that never goes away. Um, there, there's this idea that once you're like a published writer, like you're home free and you're living the dream and you are living the dream, but you're constantly looking over your back to see if you need to, to get your, your day job back or, you know, seeing if there's another gig that you could be getting that will allow you to continue making what might be a weirder, less commercial kind of work that you'll get less money for, but that means a lot to you. So basically, it's just a process of balancing these small amounts of money that you're getting from a lot of different places and uh, balancing how much time you have to put into the work that you're doing. Well, and there's another piece of this that I'll, I'll say, because we weren't actually allowed to take an advance because the, it's actually a weird story about Newt Gingrich taking a ridiculous advance that was so large, it would never re return all of it. And the publisher was sort of accused of corruption. So anyway, they, they made this rule in Congress where, where members of Congress and their staff cannot receive advances for, the, for a book. And so our deal was exclusively royalty based. So if it never sold a copy, we never saw a dime. Um, but the other thing that was difficult about that is because we didn't have an advance. Um, you know, I, I was making $35,000 a year as a congressional staffer, and I had been for quite some time. I, I had quite a bit of student loans. And I was going to grad school at night at the same time. And so I was, I was really trying to figure out how am I going to be able to pay for this for years uh, and maybe not see anything, but, but, but more than anything, how do I just get through this? And what I ended up doing was I took out extra student loan debt um, to pay for the first three years of March um, as it led to publication. And um, I actually had to take out so much debt just to be able to get the book off the ground. I never, I wasn't able to pay it off until after the third book won the national book award um it was it was but, but it was sometimes you know i would never recommend any young person ever to do that and i didn't tell my mother and when i did tell my mother that she nearly killed me i mean she was pissed it was she was i mean she was like it's a great idea but you're gonna ruin your you know i mean she was mad and she was right to be because that was an incredibly dangerous thing to do um, but I believed so deeply that this was something that had to be done that I, I literally risked everything, um, uh, everything I had, everything I owned. I was, I was worth less than nothing until my third book. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's just, that's, that's the nature of the beast. Sometimes it's, it's just a big risk. And sometimes you just do whatever it is you have to do to get by. But the myth that, um, look, I mean, we've done well, but we're not John Grisham. You know what I mean? And it's like, uh, I mean, the, the biggest thing I was saving for, to be honest, was that I thought I was going to be paying for my mother's long-term health care. And the only thing that made that not a burden was that my mother passed away. And so uh, then you're left with this awful disorienting feeling where you're like, I worked so hard so I would be able to take care of that. What do I do now? And um, I still haven't gotten past that, to be honest. You know, mama died last year and it's, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. So anyway, we're not rich, if that's the question. <laughs> Thank you. Do you think, Miriam, are you ready to um, connect? We've got um, a group that is in Towson, Maryland. It's being led by Towson University in partnership with the Baltimore City Public Schools and Towson University uh, Center for Student Diversity. And I can see them there and it looks like maybe they're ready to jump in with a couple questions. Miriam? Hi, we're in Baltimore and I have two students with great questions, so I'll get out of the way. Okay, our first question is, what are your thoughts on racial pro progression and how can we go from there? And how can we go from here? Nate, you wanna go first? You want me to go first? Uh, I'd, I'd say that, uh, okay, so speaking as somebody who lives in a fairly, fairly progressive town in a super not progressive state in the Midwest, but somebody who's also a Southerner, uh, to me, I find, I find that when I'm comparing the American South to the American Midwest in terms of race and inequality, in terms of, of, of power, in terms of justice, um, 
in a lot of ways, I find that where I live in the Midwest is a lot more backwards than anywhere I lived in the traditional South. And this is for a specific reason. I mean, the South, the South is real messed up too, y'all. I mean, America is a messed up place. So I don't mean to, to downplay that, but I, this is where I think that um, the Midwest, generally speaking, to paint with a really broad brush, is, is populated much more deeply by, by folks who don't ever have to escape their particular bubble. They don't have to encounter people who aren't essentially coming from the same template that they came from. And I, I feel like uh, Midwestern American racism is a lot more based on fear, uh, on fear of the unknown and on fear of people who aren't just like you than Southern American racism, which is, which is nasty in other ways, but requires understanding that Southern culture is a lot more owes a much deeper debt to the actual melding of, of, of black and white culture, of hillbilly and Creole culture, uh, of all these things that, that constitute something which despite its, despite its inequality, despite its nastiness, dis, despite its continued segregation is debatably a shared social framework, uh, which is something that continues to make the South special and beloved to me. I see the Midwest as being a lot more segregated in terms of spaces that are used, uh, modes of just conversation style, casual day-to-day -day living. I feel like it, it results in a lot more fear uh, from otherwise comfortable white folks here in the Midwest. And I think uh, the most urgent thing is getting people engaging with folks in their community who they don't know and who aren't necessarily like them at first glance. Uh, I think it's really easy for folks to not have to try. And I think a lot of the pushback that's happening against equality, against justice, towards resegregating society, a lot of the impetus for that uh, is the best way I've been able to boil it down in my mind is like, there's a cross section of folks who have decided that they, they're they not interested in even pretending to try anymore, even pretending to make the effort. It makes me look back to like the last 20, 30 years of my life uh, and recognizing that, yeah, a lot of the folks who are kind of sitting in the fence and aren't trying too much, it, it, it's odd to like feel this level of pushback in our society so that you're actually valuing people pretending to put forth some effort. The gesture of effort, sadly, has, it's, it's worth more now to just have those basic gestures towards cooperation, towards sharing space, towards sharing society. Um, so I feel like people being able to physically be present in the same space in their shared society, in our neighborhoods, in our community, this goes so much further than I've ever really given it, uh, given it the benefit for in the past. And, and I feel like that's an immediate, easy change that each of us on a, you know, think globally, act locally level uh, are, are able to do. We're able to engage in our communities physically on the streets, you know, in stores, in restaurants, in schools, in our community, in our churches. Uh, and I feel like that knocks down a lot of that fear, a lot of that anxiety, and allows people to deal with the fact the world is a lot more complex and rich and diverse than they want to pretend it is. Yeah, I think I agree with everything you just said. The only thing I'll add to it is that um, no, no, no baby is born hating another person. Children are taught to hate. Children are, are taught these prejudices. And that's why it's so important that we do everything we can to change the way groups of people are taught about race, about other people, about our history, about our shared past. Because 
ultimately it goes back to Nate's comment about, about so much of this being driven by fear. Uh, LBJ had another quote. He's like, you give a man to ha- someone to hate, you can pick his pocket all day. And again, that's, that's what a lot of this is about. It's about dividing people so that you can control them. And so they teach this hate, they teach these prejudices. And, you know, for me, um, the way I deal with it, especially with everything that the administration has done um, to uh, belittle and um, ostracize uh, Muslim immigrants in this country is that I simply talk about it. My, my whole life, my mom was mad and never wanted me to shave my, they never wanted me to uh, have a beard. She always wanted me to shave because she never wanted me to look Muslim. Um, and I, I grew up in the Methodist church, but my father is what everybody thinks of as a Muslim and, or was. And um, so I talk about it. I let people know I'm not afraid of it. And it was funny because at first on the Hill, uh, working in the congressman's office, people would be like, oh, but you're a good one. And I would just be like, what the hell does that mean? You know, because um, this idea that we all speak for everybody else in our subset is ridiculous. And, and also at the same time, like, how do you know? How do you know I'm the good one? How do you know I'm that good? How do you know that the other people are bad? You know? And it's all fear and prejudice and empathy that people um, And I think oftentimes being the only person who, who looks my particular shade in, in just about any, any room um, is that you got to be you and you got to be a loud version of you. Um, you got to be respectful. You got to be kind, but don't let anybody ever tell you not to be who you are and to, to hide your culture or your ethnicity um, or the things that make you uh, unique and special. And in our society today, those are not always values that are applauded. And that's what, that's what takes courage to do things when they're not popular. And um, I think we're seeing a new awakening, but for the purposes of this discussion, you all need to continue to be unafraid to be yourselves, but at the same time, be mindful of the fact that there are real challenges that we are all facing because a generation of people taught and passed on hate and prejudices. Thank you for that question. Can we take one more from um, Maryland and then we're gonna move over to Algoma Public Library in Wisconsin. Andrew, Nate, do we have you until three o'clock? Yeah, 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 yeah we're good. Okay, awesome. Okay, so one more over um, in Maryland. Hi, so my question is, what does literary success um, look like to you guys and did you have any doubts when writing the book or while creating the book? Um, I think the question was, what does literary success feel like to us? And did we have any doubts while we were making the book? Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, I had lots of doubts, but um, I mean, you have, I, have, I have doubts when I get up in the morning and, and it's, it's your, your life is about overcoming your fears. Um, and I think, I think it's normal to have doubts and be scared. Uh, and I know I was. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that literary success looks any different on this side of it. Um, in some ways it's actually, uh, it's, it's really, really strange. I'll give you an example. Um, when my mom was in the hospital and I rushed down and I'm, I'm going into uh, this hospital in North Carolina and I'm trying to find my mom in the ICU and I'm sitting there and I'm talking to the nurse and my mom is largely unconscious, but she's sort of moving around and um, I'm asking this nurse all these questions and everything. And there's a downbeat and she says, look, this might be inappropriate, but do you mind if I ask you a question? And I'm like, oh no, what is this? And I said, sure, no problem. And she says, did I see you on the Rachel Maddow show? And, and my mom, basically in a coma just goes oh <laughs> and like 
she was rolling her eyes from beyond consciousness that this would happen because um you know it doesn't it, it only changes you as much as you let it and i think especially since we've done well in comics it kind of gives us some anonymity you know yes um, yes because uh you know in dc from time to time i'll get recognized and that's super weird um but it's dc and it's like everybody watches cable news all the time so so it's like cheating right but um you know i i i guess i guess there's a story that encapsulates this really well um when when i first got the phone call from chris staros the publisher at top shelf that he was going to publish march I was in my front yard with a poop bag on my hand and I was picking out my dog's poop. And so I've got the poop bag on one hand, it was just full of poop. And on the other hand, he's saying, I'm going to publish your first book. I'm like, it's amazing. Don't get poop on yourself, you know? And, and, and then at so many other different junctures where I've gotten amazing news about this. I still had to be, I was still picking up the poop. The dog doesn't stop pooping. Right. And, and, and that's it, right? Like, okay, this worked, but you're still a human being. You still have responsibilities and you still have obligations and nobody's going to come around and pick up your dog's poop for you. Like, and, it, and if, you know, maybe, maybe John Grisham has a poop picker upper. I mean, maybe, I don't know. But, but for me, it's, it's, it's all the same. I, I think the, the, the biggest change was that I get free books now. And that's, that's really a high point for me because as you can see, I have, I like them. And, and um, <laughs> you know, it's just, it, the, the only drawback that I would see is that I professionalized my hobby. You know, and I'm sure Nate's gone through this too, where like comics used to be this thing where you went to, as like a sanctuary you went to because you were looking to escape from your work. And then it's no longer an escape. I, I used to love to go to comic book conventions. It was like my, my favorite thing to do. I would bring my friends, everybody would make fun of me. I'd be like, oh, let's get, you know, I'm going to meet so-and-so. And I loved it. And now it's like, I've had to go to so many comic book conventions. that It's not that I don't love it. It's just that I'm tired. And they, 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 they all seem to be very similar wherever you go. And now I know most of the creators. So it's like, oh, hey, man, good to see you. Instead of like, oh, my God, I'm meeting you. And it's surreal and it's disorienting. And I'm grateful for it. But I miss having a hobby and a refuge. Um, and so if anything, maybe that's the only drawback really but it, it, it hasn't changed that much i don't know nate your thoughts that that was well put i think uh yeah I, i'm very much on on that similar track like my my personal path as a creator who does this as a full-time job has involved finding that balance where what is essentially my hobby like the weird stories that come out of my imagination that i'm trying to make enough time to write and draw these things has to be balanced with other projects that I believe in with other writers I believe in. Um, but that involves, I mean, because there really is not a lot of money in comics. Comics is a small pond. Uh, it involves a lot of work uh, that, kind of, that can back you up for years. So, uh, you know, like the joy of the last, the joy of 2017 for me was the fact that after the dust settled with March and March was doing well, uh, and, you know, my kids were doing fine growing up and things were cool on this front. Uh, you know, as you try to remain engaged in society to, to keep, to stay loud, to show up in the streets, we need to show up in the streets. Uh, I was able to spend most of the year just like being in this room, finally writing and drawing this one weird story that I've been kind of like cooking on the back burner for the previous seven or eight years. Uh, to me, that was success. It was carving out the time so that basically I could do without getting paid for upwards of a year to make this really weird book that I really believed in. Uh, and also, yeah, I guess in terms of comics uh, as a community, any creative network as a community, not just an industry, with what Andrew was saying about comic conventions, 
it's true. Part of it in, involves like showing up physically being a part of this community. Um, my angle on that is this is from back in like 2012. I went to a comic convention in Seattle. And part of that is like, you know, I make weird independent graphic novels, but there's this big crossover with big superhero comics and movies and video game properties and stuff. There's always a lot of like cosplayers and it's a lot of noise, you know? So I've, I've learned to kind of like cancel some of that out, but it also means that like, I don't give a lot of that even the time of day. And when I was at this comic con in Seattle, uh, you know, and I'm always like trying to get around the big costumes. I'm like, oh, I, mean, I get kind of an attitude about it. Um, I snuck two of my friends into the comic book convention and they're like, yes, we've never been to a comic con before. I was like, all right, follow me. And I was trying to get past the big open first room that's just full of cosplayers and people taking pictures and everything. So I was like, yeah, yeah, stick with me. We're going to get through all this stuff to get to, you know, the booths where all the <laughs> independent graphic novels are. And then I looked back and I lost my friends already. And I was like, oh, but I went back and they were, you know, being mesmerized by these elaborate costumes, taking pictures and, and just really being in the moment, in the space. And they're like, this is amazing. And it made me realize that I had become cynical enough because of my experience as a creator in the community that I, I wasn't really seeing the whole scene for what it was. And what it was, I think, is generally speaking, a community that's more inclusive and more accepting than other scenes and subcultures I've been a part of in my life. And it really, it gave me a reason to kind of reevaluate and like look more carefully at the community I'm a part of. And I think that's really helped turn over a new leaf for me in these last few years. Um, Sammy's group in Wisconsin. Um, do we have time for maybe one or two questions before we need to close out? Yeah, we're good on time. What? We're good on time. Great. Okay, so um, Nate and I are good on time. That is, thank you very much. So we'll take a question from Wisconsin, um, one or two, and then maybe we can actually sneak in one or two that have come from chat. Question. Oh, my question is, what is your take on Colin Kaepernick being the new spokesperson for Nike and the people against Colin Kaepernick at the Nike? My so, is, what is your take on Colin Kaepernick being the new spokesperson for Nike and people also burning their Nike mer merchandise? <laughs> okay, good question. Um, I, I think I'm pretty short on this one. I totally support Nike's decision, and I think the people who are destroying their Nike merchandise are doing something really stupid, petulant, and childlike. I, I agree with those things. Also though, to push back on Nike a little, it's important to understand Nike is a huge corporation. They're going to do what's going to make them money. Nike, <laughs> Nike doesn't care about the children who make our shoes and our clothes for pennies. Uh, so, you know, it, it's important, you know, to, they are monetizing protest and resistance. Uh, it's convenient for them, but that shouldn't, be used to detract from the impact that I think that has to keep these voices and these perspectives loud on very important issues involving injustice and police brutality. So it's, it's like, it's one of these things that's not, it's not a clean cut win-win. I, I think like it's, it's a really easy, I noticed on social media, like right when the, when the, the ad came up and the announcement, uh, it was, it was a little disheartening at times for people to watch how many people would write to be like, oh, this makes me want to go out and buy some Nikes. Like they were sticking it to the establishment. But I'm like, you guys, Nike just wants you to buy their Nikes. <laughs> like, uh, you know, like this serves both purposes. And uh, it's, yeah, it's one of these things where it's not, it's not a full win-win, but more than anything else, this helps elevate the platform of that conversation potentially, depending on where we, the people, take that conversation. We can't allow Nike to co-opt and own a social justice movement. 
Yeah, no, that's a great point because I think um, one thing the congressman often says is you got to you, sometimes you got to speak with your dollars, um, and so they're trying to um, be a part of that. I think uh, we're we're actually watching a, a tussle between two very rich groups of people, right? Whether it's the NFL Owners Association, who are a very affluent segment of the world population, um, or the owners of, of and shareholders of Nike. Um, but at the same time, if there is a financial incentive for people who are um, willing to engage in social justice activities and pay a price for it, then I say that's a good thing. Agreed. All right, Lainey? Um, my question is, um, did you plan on inflicting emotions on the younger readers? And if you did, what did you expect from them? Could you say that one more time? I'm sorry. Yeah. Did you plan on inflicting emotions on your younger readers? And if you did, what did you expect from them? So the, the emotions, so, just so I get it right, you're asking, did we plan on um, sort of, I don't want to say manipulating, but, but trying to provoke a reaction from some of our younger readers emotionally? Yes, like what yeah. kind of a reaction, like an emotion in the reading did you get from that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think a lot of this had to do with imagining my own life as an as a angry, frustrated kid. Right. And, and trying to put in scenes that would provoke both anger, hope, um, resilience. Um, my, my mom used to, to, to remind me that I should be writing this book for the nine year old I once was. And I think that was that was what I had in mind was all the different emotions that I was going through when I was a kid. Um, because there th was, in some ways it was therapy for me, you know, you, you, you think back, like how often do you get to specifically go back and address and give answers to so many of the crappy things you went through as a kid. Right. And then, and then hopefully put down the markers for the next kid who comes along. So that he has a way out and he doesn't make the same mistake that you did. He doesn't suffer the same pain that you did. Right. And, and, and that was it, right. You had to see that um, John Lewis wasn't rich. John Lewis grew up on a farm. He was just having to hide away just to get an education. Right. And, and how many times when we grow up, are there people standing in our way saying, Oh, don't be that. Don't readings for nerds or like all these sort of emotions that, that this anti-intellectual vibe that's permeated our culture in the last 20 years or even longer, you know, that, that attitude or, or on top of it, you know, the idea of mentorship and, and how we need mentors and how we need people to come and, and help us see a better way. You know, I mean, I think that was another thing where uh, I was a little bit jealous of John Lewis when I would learn about this, that, that, that he had, gotten to to be 18 19 years old and he gets jim lawson as a mentor and then he gets martin luther king jr as a mentor and like what, what are and this is this is not what i think people expect from it but part of it is it it's not just for younger readers but it's for the adults are you being that kind of mentor are you giving your time even in your own professional success to bring people with you to bring another generation with you, to teach them the things that you've learned, to be able to succeed, to be able to survive and thrive. Um, and I think that was, there's both sides of that coin very much in the uh, decision process of what we put in there. And I think the other thing is, is that I wanted there to be righteous indignation uh, among, among the younger readers. I, I wanted them to genuinely ask yourself, like, why is this acceptable? Why do we let this happen in our society? What, what, why is this, why was this considered acceptable at one point? So that hopefully they could have this internal conversation with themselves about other things that are happening just like that right now in our society. And they would share that same righteous indignation and they could exhibit it publicly, that they could, they could express themselves and have the tools and the, the tactics 
to be able to express themselves successfully. On, on my, for my contribution to this, um, a lot of this for me is filtered through being a dad and watching in real time my older daughter's reaction to the world around her, but also to a lot of this material as I was drawing it and as it was getting out into the world. Um, for, to, to me, what, what answers this is like, we, we, but in just speaking as being the artist, I feel like I had a re, my primary responsibility was to tell the story, finding a balance between this accurate, responsible representation and an emotional, intimate connection to the people involved. And sometimes that means getting so close to the characters that you're beyond a place of judgment. Uh, hopefully you are seeing, hearing, smelling what they are, experiencing what they are. And yeah, so that in the same way that it works for like a, a director of a movie, yes, that does in fact involve manipulating emotions in that it involves taking someone on a journey, letting, letting them be in someone else's shoes. and. Uh, for me, I think uh, what was most impactful in March book two uh, had to do with drawing the massacre that happened on the Freedom Rides at the Montgomery, Alabama Greyhound Station. So, you know, I read the material, I read the reference, I read the script, I knew what I was getting into. But basically, to me, the most disturbing thing I had to draw in all of March was from historically accurate. Um, Jim's Zwerg, uh, John Lewis's seatmate on the Freedom Rides, had already been beaten unconscious uh, by some white supremacists. And it was a mom, a dad, and their little kid. Dad was holding his unconscious head between his knees, and mom and dad were encouraging their three to four-year-old son to claw at his face and eyes. Um, but it wasn't until I sat down and drew this that it really started to uh, haunt me. And the way it haunted me is like recognizing that everyone in this book really existed or really exists. But then recognizing that this kid, you know, in the world of 2014 where I'm drawing this, I realized this kid is probably still alive. And he's like 55 or 60 years old, wondering what his memory, like if he, if he remembers it or doesn't, if he blocked it out. Um, if he it was something that haunted or disturbed him because he's being praised he's being positively reinforced by his parents for clawing at Jim, Jim Zwerg's face and eyes but wondering if this is something that was carried with him into adulthood if it affected his relationship with his parents or maybe he's cool with it you know uh, maybe this is somebody who grew up and just you know continued being a you know being a gnarly human being gnarly in the non-surfer definition, but gnarly, like, like a, an unsavory individual. Uh, anyway, the fate of this person as an adult really stuck with me and haunted me. Uh, but for my older kid, who's six and a half now, when she was three and a half, and she was already familiar with some of, she knew who John Lewis was and had seen a lot of stuff that I'd been drawing around the studio, um, she was awake in the middle of the night for some reason, and I had a newborn also, so I was just up with both of my kids at 3.30 in the morning, and I hadn't yet watched Congressman Lewis on The Daily Show talking about March Book Two. So I was like, okay, you wanna come sit on the couch? We'll watch this. And uh, the show did this great sort of video montage uh, as John Stewart talked over it to give some context but it had a lot of the video footage and Spider Martin's photography from Bloody Sunday with the face off with the Alabama State Troopers and the massacre that occurred afterwards. But for my three and a half year old, uh, having seen some of the still images, but watching it as living, breathing video, um, she was shocked and so deeply disturbed. Uh, and her, her direct quote, if I can remember it, is basically like, uh, she was like, oh no, daddy, the police are being mean, trying to stop John Lewis and his friends from walking down the street from Selma to Montgomery. Oh no, daddy, they're fighting John Lewis. And you know, she started to cry. She was, she was shocked and terrified to actually see footage which showed 
uh, which took down that layer of abstraction that made her realize that the person who she had met, the person who she had heard me talk about for so long, uh, that this person, in fact, you know, that there was a, a, a real resonance, there was real danger, uh, that there were much bigger questions and that this was something that was a part of her world finally. So as storytellers, we have a responsibility to be a little bit emotionally manipulative. Um, but a lot of it is like, there's a lot of intense stuff and there's some brutal stuff in March. And at every turn, we had to have this conversation. Andrew, the congressman, our editor, Lee and I, um, where we realized like, we're not going to leave anything out of the story. Our responsibility is in fact to tell the story. And if that comes at a price of access or comfort for certain cross sections of our readership, uh, then that was something that we knew that we would just have to deal with once the story was told and published. But we knew that our responsibility was to tell the ugly, dark, disturbing parts of that um, and to deal with how that affected people on an, an emotional level as well as like on a level of readership and community. So that was just part of part of the responsibility of doing March was sort of being responsible for the way that that affected people's emotions on the other side. Um, how are how are we doing on time, Nate? Do you need to leave to? Oh, to yeah. Pick actually, up? I have to go down to the bus stop. So my kid's about to get home. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for being so generous with your time. Um, we, we have uh, one more question from Zion, Illinois. Uh, I will, Andrew, do you, can you stick around to answer that last question? And then we'll have heard from all the sites that have at least put forward questions, one thing. So um, Nate, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing everything and enjoy the bus. Be free to go to the bus pickup. I'm ready. Thanks. It really, Thanks for having me, everybody. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope to do this again soon sometime. We hope so too. Thank you so much. See y'all. Glad to do it. Bye. Um, and Andrew, uh, the question from our student in Zion Benton, which um, I've been asked to read, is um, did you read what was written and then decide what to draw and write? Or did John Lewis tell you what drawings to include and what other pieces of information to share? And then additionally for Andrew, did you ever see yourself writing a book? Um, so, you know, deciding what was in March was one of those collaborative processes that didn't really have a roadmap. I think sometimes the Congressman would tease me because I would quote things back to him that he'd forgotten that he said or something like that. He'd be like, you know me better than anybody who's alive. Um, and, and so, you know, some things it's like, you gotta tell. Cause it's John, it's, it's the story that John Lewis tells. Right. And that's, that's the overarching narrative where it's this personal version, right? It's the chicken story into Nashville into his freedom ride experience and things like that. Then there were other times where, you know, I would unearth a, a quote or a scene or something. And I'd be like, Congressman, we really have to include these. Um, I think one was, uh, <laughs> the uh, in, in book three, the Alabama State Legislature formally accuses uh, the marchers of, uh, I believe the word was fornication. Um, and I found this quote from the congressman that he gave to a reporter in response to it, um, where, which he says something along the lines of like, I, I don't understand why they're so obsessed in the legislature with sex. Um, it's those white people who are responsible for all of the different shades of black people that are out there. Um, and it was just like, it was so, such a meaty zing about like this, this idea um, that, that, that they, we still to this day are using sexuality and sexual relations to control people and, 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 and accuse it. And at the same time, uh, it was being done by the perpetrators of, of much of the sexual violence. Um, and, and it was, and so, you know, he kind of goes along with it and he's like, oh, okay, yeah, well, we should include that because it's very much in the vein of, we can't sweep anything under the rug. We have to do the whole thing. This is on the front, the quote was on the front page of the Montgomery Advertiser, uh, during the Selma March. And I mean, this was a really contentious thing. And yet when we look back on it, we tend to sweep those things under the rug, sanitize the history, um, and don't fully explain like how nasty and vitriolic, even those who we expect to be quote, honorable, the elected officials uh, were being and using their elected governmental power 
to harass and intimidate these protesters. Um, and so things like that were really important to me that we included in it. And so I ended up in some ways filling the role of the young radical back to John Lewis saying, you know, we, we can't be afraid to say these things. Um, and then, um, you know, I think, I think we get, we, we get along we, at that time we were able to, um, sort of be on the same page for a lot of this. So there wasn't a lot of, uh, questions about whether or not it should be included. It was that nine times out of 10, if I could find a good source and I really believed it should be in there, the Congressman would approve it. So long as it was, um, his narrative now sometimes like like if you look in book two the scene about al hibbler the blind jazz musician you know that's one where i'm like congressman we have to make sure that there's a mention in this series about disabled people participating um because we have to make sure that this isn't that we that we don't fall into the same able-bodied bias that we don't fall into the same uh, narrative biases that other works have fallen into and so this scene with al hibbler getting into a fight with bull connor i found a reference to it um, and made sure that all the quotes were sourced and then we were able to, to include it. Um, and then, I'm sorry, Lainey, what was the second part of the question? It was, did you ever see yourself writing a book? Oh, I mean, the short answer to that is no. Um, I, I loved reading books. I didn't know that I had it in me to write one. I, I think and I think that's part of it, right? Is that we're never told that we can write books. And I think everybody on this call has the capacity uh, and the talent and the ability to write a good book. Um, it is not as hard as you think. It's just about persistence. It's about coming back to your table or your desk or to your computer every single day for weeks, months, and, and yes, years. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't do it. And it doesn't mean it won't be good. Um, but you have to be willing to commit yourself to that that long um, process, that 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 true uh, suffering for your art in in a certain way. I mean, it's an endurance sport. You're not sprinting. Um, and then you know, there's another side of this where I asked my mom shortly before she passed away. Um, I said, "Mama, did you ever think when I was growing up and it was quiet and you're looking down at that?" scraggly kid did you ever think that maybe one day he might grow up to do something like this not necessarily win the national book award but, but maybe something like that you know something on that scale and my mother said i love you with all my heart son but no and <laughs> on the one hand I, I think about that constantly because it means i surpassed my mother's wildest dreams for me but on the other hand it means that it means that there are things that we can do that even those who love us the most don't know that we can do. And, and we have to remember that because it means that we can't be afraid to try because we might not just surprise ourselves, we'll surprise everybody else around us. I think John Lewis was more surprised by the success of March than just about anybody else. And, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think I'd write a book. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you for sticking around a little bit extra to take a couple extra yeah. questions and just always being so generous and such a wonderful speaker. I hope everyone has enjoyed the session. I wanted to take just one moment um, to say uh, hello and send our best wishes to the people who plan to be with us today but are going to be joining. Um, offline. Um, they were not able to be with us because of the hurricane watch, especially hello to the readers at the Wayne County Public Library in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Um, we're sorry you couldn't make it and we hope you're all doing well. Um, thanks again to all of you for being here, especially the readers listening in. Um, we're wishing you the best in the school year ahead and everything and thanks so much to Nate and Andrew. Yeah, please everybody stay in touch. It's an honor to be able to speak with you and I'd love to hear from you all again at some point. And please invite me to Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna send you a survey too. If you could take a couple minutes to fill it out, that would help us with our grant to the NEA. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.